few years ago, I was in the audience in this very hall of just such a horticultural society, society meeting. An ecologist from Melbourne U Uni University was the invited speaker who presented a science that I couldn't quite relate to. It was a science of correct and incorrect species. What, what was most apparent to me was that the presenter had no awareness of her own ideology. Coming from the humanities and reading philosophical texts like the sublime object of ideology, you are constantly challenged to be aware of your ideological conceits. In the Q&A afterwards, at this, in this very hall, I asked the presenter from Melbourne Uni, are you aware that in this area, the dominant habitat tree for ringtail possums is the common hawthorn? They build their drays in it. And if we keep sentencing to death these so-called incorrect species, then aren't we just enacting mass killing on ideological grounds and in doing so displacing indigenous fauna? She brushed off my local observation, um, and I believe because it didn't fit the, uh, the ideological narrative of the current scientific orthodoxy. No doubt what I'm about to say will come across as a form of heresy for some in the science community, especially those seeking faith in established or concrete um, truths and those whose livelihoods depend on defending such a faith. This is a, true across humanity, but I think science is a very special case because science is the only field of human activity that um, professes to operate from an objective place. But of course, as, as the philosopher David Abram argues, um, when a scientist chooses a field of study, uh, they, don't do it, they don't do that dispassionately. Having a job in the science is quite possibly your gateway to establishing dogma and closing off from real discovery in your field. Your job will determine you complement the institution paying you, not necessarily complement what you're actually observing. The Australian Association of Bush Regenerators are more open than some in regards to newcomer willow ecologies. They say, we have altered much of the habitat around us as such that the original native species no longer have their competitive advantages. New weedy species in many cases prove to be much better adapted to this modified landscape. If we take any rational dislike to some of these species and attempt to eradicate them, then we open the possibility of causing more or different problems. My doctoral work, uh, which was paid for by Australian taxpayers, and my subsequent research, which I'm very proud, is funded through the veggies our household grows, the weeds we harvest and eat, and the community bartering, gifting, and shepherding we do, resides somewhat within what is currently called the ecological humanities and the ecological post-humanities, which might be better explained as the much more than human humanities. We are never only one thing. We are made up of more non-human cells than human. Our breath is life, which we inhale, and on the exhale, a part of making more life possible. The post-humanities serve as a timely critique of human-centric orthodoxies. I would go so far to say that orthodox violence is so common it is barely even seen today. Orthodoxy is the ideological position that believes one is not operating ideologically, but rather one is operating from the correct point of view. Here's an example very common to our culture. A road is more important than a tree. Cars are more important than creeks and rivers. Now, I agree, no one actually goes out and says this directly, because even the most ecologically disassociated person still has a basic sense that we need trees and water. Rather, it's part of a more general cultural acrasia that enables our culture to put cars and roads before trees and creeks, be it road building through Jabarong sacred trees, such as we're seeing in the Western Highway, 
or the, the threat of that, or the creekside removal of incorrect biota, the bulldozer is always correct. We cannot invest in such a grandiose tool and have it and its operator sit in the shed all day. I sometimes think of that when I walk past my spade hanging in the shed. <laughs> That's a pretty grandiose tool, but I think it's an awesome tool. Appropriate technology, I suppose. Everything must fall to the logic of the bulldozer or the excavator leaving the shed each morning. In making the case for the worth and innumerable givings of newcomer common and outlaw pioneer plants, otherwise known as weeds, I'm not making the case against indigenous biota. I am, however, making a case for biodiversity being much more diverse than what is currently perceived by the orthodoxy, and thus much more than human in its framing and understanding. If science refuses to observe more than human life ways, such as the ringtail in, in the hawthorn, so if, if science refuses to observe more than human um, life ways, culture and consciousness, it will continue to act violently against the living of the world. That is, the world that wants to live. One local council biodiversity officer I have spoken with in recent years uses a subtle device to speak the language of correct and incorrect species. He calls indigenous flora plants and non-indigenous flora weeds. It's quite ingenious, really, and sounds quite innocent. But as we know from history, such distinctions or classifications are strategic in setting up the intellectual framework for what Deborah Bird Rose, the anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose, calls man-made mass death. This is very clearly distinct, uh, distinguished from ecological killing, the need to eat, to our cultural way of being, which is often mass death. It's a commitment to uh, irradiating landscapes, to, to put in the correct la landscapes. Foregrounding the worth of newcomer biota doesn't, in some reductionist sense, mean the disappearing or subjugating of old-timer species. By old-timer, I mean indigenous, and newcomer, I mean everything that's come since colonization. I love and respect Jarra Country's indigenous biota, the land on which I have emplaced over 25 years and I now call home. And I also love and respect my own ancestral biota, which also has emplaced on this country and which nourishes me, my family, broader community, um, human and non-human, broader community. I pay my deepest respects to both Jarrah peoples and my own cultures, plant smiths and medicine makers, croppers and foragers. They held sacred, and we are trying to put back in place, detailed plant, food and medicine knowledges from a culturally appropriate perspective. While blackwood wattle bark medicine is gathered and used in our household to treat muscular aches and parasites, most of our medicine pharmacopoeia derived from walked for newcomer species, and many are our ancestral medicines. These giving plants keep us from being dependent on big pharma and the extractive industry of capitalized medicine. In fact, in the past decade, our household has barely cost the state a single health dollar because of our disease preventative life ways with these bottles of walked for food as being very much part of that. And I brought some samples in um, just to run through them quickly. We've got dried hawthorn berry, dried wild apple, dried cherry plums, dried uh, st uh, stinging nettle, uh, psyllium husks from plantain seeds, um, acorn coffee, which is my favorite coffee, um, uh, wild fennel, favorite, I call it a spice, of course it's not a true spice, but it's, it's the equivalent of a local spice. And this incredible me medicine, um, the powder of spear thistle root. And then also some wild apple and hawthorn fruit leather. It's a physical and relational engagement with these plants that is part of the medicine even before anything is taken. 
Medicine is far broader than industry science likes to frame it. Medicine is good sleep, for example. Medicine is swimming in cold winter water. Walking for our food and medicine plants and mushrooms is very much part of our well-being. By not shopping in supermarkets, not owning cars, not flying overseas, not buying new clothes and so much more, we have become time rich to enact an entirely different social, ecological and economic cultural mode. By saying no to these big industrial systems of power and economy, we have been able to say yes to so much life that our previous lives didn't have time for. And for this, we have become keen observers and interactors with our local biomes. Modernist societies have almost entirely erased the ancient animist science traditions of the world. Medicine science didn't start with Hippocrates in ancient Greece, as we're led to believe. It began tens of thousands of years earlier across every inhabited continent. Western ethnobotany and anthropology have been appropriating indigenous knowledges for several hundred years, and Western industries have been capitalizing on such knowledges for at least 300. Ethnobotanist Wade Davis, on a mission to collect plants in the Ecuadorian Amazon for the private corporation Harvard University, writes about the Warani people in relation to pre-industrial science. He stayed in, uh, with them for a number of weeks, and he met this guy called Wep. Wep, like all Warani I met, writes Davis, turned out, uh, turned out to be not only a keen observer, but an exceptionally keen naturalist. It was not just the sophistication of his interpretations of biological relationships that impressed me, Davis continues. It was the way he classified the natural world. He often could not give you the name of a plant, for every part, roots, fruit, leaves, and bark had its own name. Nor could he simply list a fruit tree without listing all the animals and birds that depended on it. So I asked the ecologist from Melbourne Uni again, what animals depend upon the hawthorn? I have observed ringtail possums, gangangs, various cockatoos, karawang, karawongs, and a number of small bird nests made in the branches. Wade Davis's sensitive, albeit almost conceited, surprise of pre-industrial scientific knowledge, as represented by his fly-in, fly-out Western academic sensibility, goes some way to understanding the differences between static walls of knowledge secreted in university cities and the flow of common knowledge that occurs in ecological cultures of place. The, the contrast is stark and the ramifications are enormous. When a biodiversity officer lands a job in a community in Australia, he or she does not spend years listening to the local human and non-human or more than human informants of that community, but rather comes with a pre-packaged agenda, ready to impose his or her pre-existing ideology on those communities. His or her job, in effect, says you must act, you must justify your wage. So there's an economic imperative to get the bulldozers out, to get the spray packs out. Um, biodiversity in the hands of such ideological orthodoxy has become a human-centric war that pits correct against incorrect. Biodiversity officers and researchers draw only on a science that evaluates the negatives caused by newcomers. For your average biodiversity officer or university ecologist, there is rarely a question of what science am I leaving out and what science am I advancing. There is often the absence of local knowledge. The single greatest threat to life on this planet, I, I believe, is the romanticization of modernity and its various shades of monetized industry and so-called progress. Both sides of politics are invested in such romance of human ingenuity, progress on the right, progressiveness on the left. In a tight-knit left-right union, progress and progressiveness demand that Gores is the enemy of the state. 
on the right, the, the reason to act against gorse is that is industry, bulldozers, jobs, pesticides, and a general moral high ground of dominion over nature. On the left, the reason to act aims to address the horrors of colonization and thus to fix history. Fixing ideologies are reactive and generally lead to violence of some form as well. Healing rather than fixing is being attuned with how more than human consciousness works. Healing the endless disruptions of anthropocentric capital on Aboriginal country can occur one weed soup at a time. Human cultures that background technology and foreground ecological knowledge are the only truly sustainable societies we have ever known. <clears throat> so do we need to raise again human communities who are ecologically literate, who are keen observers of what is actually happening? This is not to say that biodiversity officers have no knowledge. It's just the, the compartmentalizing of knowledge and the disappearing of certain observations, which is such a problem. Common or European gorse is a prohibited plant in this country, a country formulated upon the great lie of terra nullius. Gorse is one of the 20 weeds of national significance if you take nation to mean non-seeded or trammeled terra. Gorse is a restricted invasive plant under the Biosecurity Act 2014 a law that protects capital but not gypsy floras who move around free of domesticated slavery and thus inspire resentment by nationhood subjects who are far less free. <laughs> the industrial fuels, pesticides and labour force used to attempt to control gorse cost around $1,500 per hectare, according to the Australian Government's Department of Environment and Energy back in 2003. I couldn't find a more recent estimate. No doubt it's much more today. However, there is another story concerning gorse. It acts as a nurse plant for healing ground and a sanctuary for many small critters. For New Zealand botanist Hugh Wilson, the reason he doesn't act against gorse is because he has put aside human-centric industry and instead observed ecological succession at play. He understands how gorse gives to life. The local community was a bit suspicious about what we were doing, I have to say. All the farmers in the area thought he was a total nutter. When I first heard of the fact that Shu and the Trust were going to use gorse to help regenerate the natives, um, I was a, a, a sceptic of it. They went, no, he's going to let gorse grow. You can't let gorse grow. I come from a rural background. Gorse is a weed. You get rid of gorse. You burn it, you poison it, you bulldoze it, but you get rid of gorse. Gorse is a terrible, terrible weed for pastoral farming. It's shocking. And, and no one, let alone me, would deny that. But it's also, almost nothing is black and white, is it? If you've got it and it's sort of infested the landscape irretrievably in a way, it's worth looking at its good points and seeing, well, maybe we don't have to fight it. On this marginal hill country, fighting it usually makes it worse because that's what gorse thrives on. So we said, no, we're just going to leave the gorse alone on this gorse-infested pasture. We don't want pasture, we want native forest to regenerate and gorse is a wonderful nurse canopy for native forest regeneration. It's an opportunistic plant. It takes advantage of cleared ground and forest climates. But it can't stand uh, shade. It has to have full sunlight. So as soon as it's shaded, it's dead. So it grows quite fast in the full light, but then other things come in underneath it, naturally. Shade-tolerant hardwood trees, for example, and they just thrive under the gorse shelter. The gorse is a nitrogen fixer, so it's actually fertilising the soil all the time, with nitrates a very important a nutrient for plant life. I initially thought that the progression from gorse to native trees would take 50 years, but in 10 years you could see it. You could see them coming up through the gorse in areas that I didn't, I didn't realise there would be natives growing.
And now, of course, you're not getting pasture back, but you're getting native forest back with all its benefits. Increased benefits now with carbon sequestration as well as all the ecological and biodiversity values that are being fostered this way. Our whole philosophy is what I call minimal interference management. People have an inflated opinion of what Homo sapiens is capable of. I hate to say this because I'm a Homo sapiens as well. <laughs> but um, we're really good at damaging things. We're not all that good at putting things right. But all the serious work of natural regeneration of native forest and wildlife has been done by nature. People say to us, oh, you're planting all this forest back. And, and it's a sensible sounding question, but really if we were planting this forest back, we'd never do it on 1,500 hectares of land, of wild, hilly, rough terrain. We'd never do it. Nature has planted the forest back in totally ecologically appropriate and scientifically interesting ways. So, um, yeah, minimal interference. I love it. <laughs> um, so we might just leave um, Hugh's wonderful work there for a mi minute. But, yeah, I, I urge you to watch the whole film. It's really a beautif beautifully put together work and a really, um, I guess, important work to, to, this, to this space of um, understanding more than humans and their will and what they're doing. <laughs> We are, we're really good at getting in the way of good work. And um, yeah, so the, the way modern humans live is an arguably earth-destroying um, in, in the most part. Therefore, we seem to need many scapegoats to point the finger at in order to avoid pointing at ourselves. Um, we need a common enemy that we can all feel good about killing. I think that brings us together <laughs> as a culture. Gorse is one such common enemy, and it is reassuring, however, with botanists like Hugh Wilson, that such a post-human science is emerging. That is a science able to fully sense and open to non-human will. For me, stories like Hugh's hi highlight a potential return to an animist inclusivity a return to a walked-for sensibility with the living of the world. Can we imagine the intelligence of a science where people see themselves as creatures of place rather than godlike extractors, dominators, and correctors of life? I'd like to spend some time now to go through just a small handful of innumer numerous um, common and outlawed species our household incorporates into our diet on most days, or at least, I should say, there's at least one or two of these species incorporated into the diet throughout the year, each day throughout the year. So start with the common hawthorn. So these little um, amazing berries are very much part of our European, those of you from European countries, um, our very old way of getting through the cold winters. There's an ethnobotanist um, who I think is also called Hugh, and I forget his surname, but um, I think he's passed away now. But I once saw a video of his about 10 years ago showing how to make fruit leathers out of um, hawthorn berries. And he, his theory is that um, our early ancestors used um, sun-fermented uh, fruit jerky or hawthorn jerky to get through the long, cold months because it locked up the vitamin C in them. The hawthorn has numerous common names, including hoar, hawberry, thorn apple, maybush, may blossom, maythorn, quickthorn, whitethorn, mother dye, one seed hawthorn or single seed uh, hawthorn, and uh, azarola in Spanish. The scientific name Crataegus monogena derives from the Greek. Crataegus means strength. Monogena means one-seeded. Um, hawthorns have no legal status in Australia, but then again, Australia has no real legal status either, I would argue. <laughs> <laughs> Hawthorn is endemic to Europe, Northwest Africa, Afghanistan, and Western Asia. It is broadly distributed throughout Southeast Australia and other temperate climates of the world. 
and was introduced to Australia as an agricultural hedge plant in the 19, 1830s. Seed dispersal occurs through various newcomer and old timer fauna. Um, the fruits are pomes, which are like crab apples or apples of briar rose, quince, pears, medlars, etc. Um, but look more like a berry. Hoar fruit are various hues of red depending on soil types and um, moisture availability. They are oblong and range in size. These ones are almost round, so they've dried more round. Um, <clears throat> uh, we soak the fruit, um, although there's no need to in wetter countries, um, and mash them, uh, mash the wet, uh, the, the wet pulp through a sieve to remove the seeds and the skin. And on the back of the sieve, you just, slice, you just scrape off the gelatinous, um, beautiful pulp. Uh, yeah, I guess it's the pulp, pulpy gel, I guess you'd call it. Um, and then you put that into a, 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 a shallow bowl and then it sets very quickly. I mean, if, if any of you jam makers are out there, you'd know that hawthorn berries have a, a high degree of pectin. Um, and so the, it, it sets very quickly, probably within half an hour. You turn the bowl upside down and then slice it and then put it on a rack to put in the sun or dehydrate it. Um, if you add something sweeter to it, even though that brings out the sugars in the hawthorn, um, if you add something sweeter like uh, we have with the fruit leathers here, and feel free to um, take one and pass them around and have a chew while you're... So that's wild apple and hawthorn fruit leathers. But it is good to add something a bit sweeter mm. to it. That one's got quince in it as well, right? Um, yeah, uh, so the common hawthorn is the species used for traditional herbalism applied in both Chinese and Western medicine traditions to generally treat the cardiovascular system, um, uh, but particularly high blood pressure. Blood pressure that's permanently high is one of the main risks, uh, risk factors for heart disease. Extracts made from hawthorn parts provide antioxidant and phytochemical benefits. And the seasoned wood is good for burning and emits little smoke. It's highly durable. Fine grain timber is used for um, tool making. I, I use it for handles to replace uh, rake handles and slash uh, hooks and things like that. Um, and it's good for joinery. It's so fine. The, um, in fact, Meg, have you got yeah, hawthorn earrings? You, the, the, the grain is just, that's probably a 15-year-old tree. So it's very, very tight grain. It's beautiful. It's a hardy, drought-tolerant um, plant. And the rootstock uh, is used for grafting of other poems, such as medlars and pears. Um, the Goldfields West Management Weed Index states that hawthorn is quite promising, Pro uh, this is quite promising at first, often used by small birds as shelter and nest sites, and some birds feed on the berries. Um, but after noting this benefit, the index proceeds immediately to this sentence, usually killed by cutting the trunk and painting or injecting herbicide. <laughs> <laughs> this must be done when the tree is in leaf. Uh, from my observation, hawthorn is the preferred habitat for ringtail possums, as I've mentioned, in this, in this area. Um, there, you know, you, you move out of this wetter climate, and the the amount of hawthorns decrease quite dramatically. Um, hawthorns offer food to multiple bird species, including various cockatoos as well as possums and wallaroos. Um, being long-lived, they offer long-term carbon sequestration, um, especially as they are fire retarding. They also offer habitat for numerous species, including. Um, finches, wrens, thornbills, and other small foraging birds. So the European blackberry, thanks, Brenna. <laughs> um, otherwise known as bramble, brambleberry, caneberry, thicketberry, is one of our favorite summer fruits. Um, again, it has no legal status in Australia. It is a thorny, scrambling cane sh sh uh, shrub which forms thickets or brambles up to four meters high. The broad leaves are approximately three centimeters long. The many uses are 
the black ripe fruit is edible, as are the other aerial parts, flowers for salads, leaves for tea. The, the, tea, the leaf tea has similar properties and health benefits to um, raspberry leaf tea, so it can aid uh, morning sickness, labour and pregnancy related cramps, as well as muscle discomfort. Uh, the tannins in the leaves enable a number of benefits um, as long as the doses are small. Too many tannins cause liver damage. Um, the berries are rich in antioxidant vitamins A, C and K, contain minerals such as magnesium, copper and potassium and are high in fibre. Unripe red fruit can cause stomach upset. I've been running a bush school and some of the kids um, have really demonstrated that. <laughs> Not quite patient enough. Um, blackberry is an excellent fodder for browsing ruminants. I, I mentioned goats before. The goats seek out the berries, the new shoots and leaves, and eat them in great quantities, making targeted browsing or managed herbivory the best biological control of tenacious blackberries in Australia. If I've been working with goats for a little while now, and they're re really, they really love blackberries. Um, goats also stomp down the canes as they walk into a patch um, and they begin to, with the, with the canes on the ground, um, they begin to uh, rot very much more quickly, um, reducing the fire risk. And also the blackberry canes are very uh, lignin rich, so lignin is obviously a really great material for making soil, for making soil humus. Um, reducing blackberry dominance is an easy method of crushing the canes in, until succession plants are established. Uh, again, like the gorse, they don't like being shaded out. So it's getting them down onto the ground and getting the blackwood wattles and the oaks and whatever you're planting to, to shade them out. <clears throat> uh, crushing the canes. And the other thing is, uh, is about um, uh, this idea of eliminating them entirely. It's like, well, if they're just a remnant small ground cover and they're providing you with some summer fruit, that's fantastic. So if they are shaded out, they may not ever go totally, but they're not being, they're being, they're becoming a part of the ecology, not the dominant factor of it. Uh, we've developed over the years after David Holmgren's work um, blackberry surfing, uh, which I've been doing with the kids, which is basically getting a board from the tip and uh, going down a steep gully and sort of throwing it like a skateboard and going down like that and then sort of working your way down and if you've got a whole bunch of kids in a line, they can just do a huge swathe, uh, a massive patch like a tennis court in 10 minutes. Um, it's, it's actually very easy to, uh, to manage blackberry. Um, so English, uh, there's lots more to say about that, but I think we'll, I'll just quickly go through some of the others. Um, the English oak, uh, the word um, druid can be translated as oak knowledge, and I really like that. Uh, there's something very special about oak, oaks for me. I, I started my environmental consciousness as a forest activist, and I was very pro-Indigenous fauna and against everything else. But something in my heart, and I think I, I would call it maybe bone memory, was kept getting drawn to these incredible oaks and willows beside creeks on hot summer days. And like my European skin and blood was finding that a, a, quite a salve. I really love how... Um, this area is such a beautiful uh, uh, amalgam of old timer and newcomer species, and um, I think there's lots of uh, there's there's lots to be to be discovered in that in the in the in the way in which these species abut each other, live next to each other, um, don't not necessarily counsel each other out. Yeah, so the legal status uh, of the English oak is zero. It's a minor, uh, considered a minor environmental weed. Acorns of most species make a good nutty meal or grain for baking or as a coffee substitute, and I've also brewed beer with it. Every species of acorn is edible, uh, but some have more tannins than others. 
uh, re removing the tannins is in improving the flavors pretty much. So it's really just an experiment with your, with your own acorns. Um, there, are a number, there are a number of methods. You can find online good methods. You can cross-reference a whole lot of different um, recipes on how to steep out the tannins and prepare the acorns. Ac acorns contain protein, are considered a complex co carbohydrate, and are reported to aid in controlling blood sugar levels. Acorns contain the minerals mag magnesium, manganese, copper, calcium, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as B vitamins. Oak leaves are an alkalizing medium in a compost, um, and considering our soils are quite acidic around here, um, one local farmer, uh, actually market gardener, um, Edward at Adson Farm, uses just his winter oak leaves. So he's got two massive oak trees, gathers them all up, puts them through a shredder with all the town's coffee wastes, and that's his substrate that he grows all his um, uh, spring vegetables on. Yeah, so the oak leaves are soil builders. Older trees uh, provide hollows for habitat, um, and uh, you know, ringtail possums you'll often find in an, in an oak tree. Uh, and they provide food um, for indigenous fauna, um, cooling and shade, which in a climate changing era cannot be underestimated as an ecological service. This is another argument that uh, David Holmgren particularly and others like myself made about the willows at, um, at Jubilee Lake, Lake Jubilee. Um, he, David worked out a figure of the air conditioning units that those willows provide through summer and that going into drier and drier seasons there is potentially a place for European biota uh, or for particularly drought hardy European biota to keep cool, to keep uh, the ground from being um, uh, exhausted of its moisture, I guess. So uh, we might go to black elderberry, um, also known as European elder, European elderberry, European black elderberry, elder elderberry, and just black elder. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite uh, yeah, one of my favorite ferments to make is uh, elderflower cider. It's the quickest um, ferment to make. People often make it for a wedding or a birthday. You can put it on 10 days beforehand and it'll be perfect. It's very simple to make. We use our local honey, um, water, and elderflower, and that's it. And it's just delicious. And if you leave it in the brewing pot for a few months, it kind of goes... I don't know, a rocket fuel in a way. <laughs> the indigenous range includes Europe and North America, and the naturalized range includes southeastern mainland Australia and Tasmania. It is considered a minor environmental weed and therefore has no uh, biological status. Um, black elderberry is still used as a cure for the common cold. It is considered antimicrobial, antiviral, and an immune stimulant. Uh, elder leaf um, ointments and emollients are used to treat sprains, bruises, chill blains, etc. Unripe uh, or unfermented or uncooked elderberries can be dangerous as they can they call they contain cyanogenic uh, glycosides. Glycosides. Elders are used uh, as food habitat. Uh, the trees are used as food habitat and for shade uh, by more. Th uh, by more than humans. Uh, wild apple, um, which is really naturalized domesticated apple variety, so it's a quite an unusual one. Um, it, its indigenous range um, goes back to the grandparent species, which I think is um, Malus cervicii, um, which is from Kazakhstan in Central Asia. Its naturalized range on this continent includes southeastern mainland Australia and Tasmania. It has no legal status and is considered a minor environmental weed. We make cider, dried fruit, stewed fruit, fruit leather, juice and vinegar from wild apples and it makes uh, great fresh fruit in summer and autumn months. And wild apples provide habitat for ringtail possums 
I've seen quite a number of drays built in wild apples, which I'm not quite sure why, because they don't offer the thorny protection that the, the hawthorns do. Uh, yes, and so apple seeds are eaten by cockatoos, so that the apples you often see peg, pegged open and the flesh left, but the, the cockatoos go for the seeds. It's another fire retarding tree and offers shade and soil protection from the harsh sun. Um, plantain uh, is called um, ribwort or uh, wound herb. Um, I like to use it. It's my favorite go-to in the bush school. Kids are always cutting themselves with knives. It's a fantastic Band-Aid. You just get some um, leaves masticate them in your, lee, in your mouth, um, break open the, 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 glute, uh, the, the mucolaginous gel. You won't really see it, but it'll be in your saliva. And then you put it on the, her uh, on the herb, on the wound, and it, it coagulates the blood, um, so thickens the blood very quickly. Um, and it's antimicrobial. It, so it cleans the blood, it thickens the blood, and it soothes um, the wound. So yeah, the younger, tender leaves uh, can be used in weed salads and soups. But the buckshorn plantain, which is this one here, which you can't really see there, but it's got a little cut leaf. Um, it grows in a rosette like this one, um, but it's got a really fine, again, it's often in lawns, and it's got a cut leaf, but you can still see the five ribs that, that run along the, the leaf. And that's why it's called ribwort, because you can see the five ribs there. If you have a close look at these smaller leaves, you can still see the five ribs. They're really delicious um, to eat raw. Dried seed husks make a cilium, cilium for, as a prebiotic gut fiber. A prebiotic gives the ecology, or provides the humus, if you like, for good probiotics to, um, to grow onto. So fibers like alliums, leeks are a really great prebiotic. So wild fennel, I'll finish with wild fennel, which is the name of a new herbal medicine group about to start up in Dalesford. Yeah, and the aim of the, the wild fennel group is to share old and new knowledges regarding non-privatized medicine. Wild fennel is an aromatic perennial herb, high in vitamin C. Uh, potassium, manganese, and fiber, and all parts are edible. Leaves and peels, stalks can be eaten raw in salads. The bulbs are small, are much smaller than cultivated fennel, and can be cooked as a vegetable. Um, just when you're foraging wild fennel, it's really important not to, at this time of the year when the seeds are ready to be harvested, hemlock, which can be growing next to it, can also have seed heads, even though they look completely different plants throughout most of the year, they both die back to the similar stalks with the habit of seeds, uh, with the seed head um, dispersed like this, and the seeds look almost identical. So um, you've just got to be careful, and of course, just by feeling and smelling, you'll, you'll smell the, the aniseed or aroma, or the licorice aroma. So yeah, just a few notes in conclusion. To be biologically engaged with these tenacious health-giving plants means we can increase our divestment from industrial food and medicine. If we truly look at the negative impacts of the, these industries, it is not difficult to act. In fact, it's, in, it's an imperative that we act. Our creeks and rivers are awash with antidepressants. Um, and over-prescribing antibiotics to human and livestock has depleted the effectiveness of these drugs. Monocultural agriculture and a globalized food distribution system is destabilizing the climate. And knowing all this is why uh, my family and I and many others in the Shire um, are, not, are, are not shopping in supermarkets, um, reducing car travel, um, buying bicycles or getting on bicycles. Um, and we, we've stopped, we stopped flying 10 years ago. Um, when it comes to divesting from a wrecking ball economy, everything is back on the kitchen table, uh, including weeds. 
If we want to connect with and belong to non-ceded Aboriginal land as non-Indigenous Australians, then are we to bring more war to this country in the form of diesel, herbicide and ideological classifications, or are we going to honour Indigenous lifeways by honouring our own? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.